topological quantum computing, which would allow maybe uh, quantum computers to become robust so they can be scaled up, become real. And the other possibility is looking into a possible femtotech. That's a technology that's a million times smaller than nanotech. So if it could be built, it would outperform nanotech by a factor of a trillion trillion. You know, a lot of, if you take the average person in the street and you talk to them about the notion of a future intelligent machine, there's a lot of skepticism because, because today's machines aren't intelligent. Right? I, mean, I mean, God, I know from my own personal experience, I get incredibly frustrated with computers. Like they crash all the time. They, they don't do what I want. I mean, literally, daily, I, I say, I hate computers, but I love them. So it's, 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 an ambivalent relationship with computers. So, so today's computers are not intelligent. So this, this you know, proverbial man in the street, skepticism against the, the notion of intelligent machines, to, to what extent is that warranted? Like, like why, why are the researchers in artificial intelligence, brain building and so why are they so much more confident that, that intelligent and later massively intelligent machines are coming? What, yeah, what, what's driving that enthusiasm? Why, why do they feel that they're justified in making these huge claims that, that massive artificial intelligence is coming? Well, I mean, there are lots of factors, but let's stick with the two main ones, so keep it simple. One is Moore's Law. Right? That, that's a phenomenon in, in electronics, microelectronics, or nowadays nanoelectronics, which says that the number of transistors you can cram onto a chip keeps doubling every 18 months, two years or so. And that phenomenon has been around since, God, early, mid, mid 60s, let's say. Uh, that's when the first uh, integrated circuits where you put more than one transistor on a chip. So you had several. And uh, more, more, Gordon Moore, a person who's still alive, I don't know, 80s now, old man. He noticed a trend. He noticed that the number of transistors on a chip kept doubling every, every 18 months or so. And he made that remark, he made that observation in 65, I think, in a famous little publication in some magazine. But that trend has been true for, well, it's calculated, 40, 50, 65, 40, 46 years, actually, 40, sorry, 46 years. That's a long time. That's a lot of, if you calculate the number of doublings. Now common sense says if you take any number, multiply it by two, and take that result and multiply that by two, by two, by two, by two, by two, many doublings. So today's chips, state of the art, today's chips, have now tens of billions of transistors on a chip, okay? So by having lots of these chips, in a large computer system, you now have as much bit processing, you know, you, you, you've got, let's say, 10 to the 16, state of the art now is about 10 to power 16 bits per second. Uh, in words, what, what is that, 10, 10 to 16? That's 10,000 trillion bits of information manipulated. You're flipping back and forth, zero, one, zero, one, zero. 10,000 trillion bits per second, which is the estimated information processing capability of the human brain. Also, 10 to power 16. Now, where does that, where does that number come from? Well, you can make a rough estimate. How many brain cells, how many neurons, they're called brain cells, in our brain that, that do the thinking? The answer is about 100 billion. That's 10 to power 11. 10 to the 11th. And on average, each brain cell connects to about 10,000 others. That's 10 to the 4. So how many connect connections total? Well, 10 to the 11 times 10 to the 4. And each connection, they're called the neuroscience guys, they, they call a connection between two brain cells. Synapse, synapse. And the maximum processing speed of a synapse, you know, how many bits of information per second can it transmit to the next neuron, is about 10 bits a second, maximum, let's say. Okay, so how many bits total? 100 billion neurons, 
each connecting about 10,000 and each connection or synapse is signaling at about 10 bits per second. How many bits per second total? Answer 10 to the 11 times 10 to the 4 times 10 to the 1. That's 10 to 16. That's the same as today's supercomputers. Now in the past, because if, if you work Moore's law backwards, you know, divide by two, divide by two, divide by two, it's only about now that there's enough computing capacity in today's state-of-the-art supercomputers to be able to simulate the human brain. Okay? So that's, that's the first condition. It's only now that it's happening. But it's not enough. But by, by having lots of bits flipping back and forth, that's not intelligence. Just lots of bits flipping back and forth. So how do you, how do you get intelligence into all that massive circuitry? Well, there's two major ways. One, you just engineer it. You do whatever you like. You, you just dream up some ideas and you just try it as engineers. That's one way. Now, people have been trying that for, what, 50, 60 years and haven't been very successful because we still don't have intelligent machines today. So a lot of people are, are rather cynical of the purely engineering approach because, because it hasn't really, we don't really know what intelligence is. So, Maybe that will work. It, it, you know, the jury's still out on that question, but you know, it's definitely an option. The engineering approach. The other major approach is the neuroscience approach. In other words, copy the brain, our brain, our biological brain. We know, like a baby gets conceived, you know, the, the, the fetus is there, it grows and grows and grows, self-assembles. It, it's DNA, you know, half from the mother, half from the father. That DNA is a kind of growth model. It instructs the baby how to self-assemble when it grows and grows. Like it starts off as one cell and multiplies, you know, two cells, four cells, eight cells, a hundred trillion cells when it's born, when the baby's born. And that baby you know, grows and grows once it's born and becomes intelligent and conscious. Okay? So we know, in you know, science, we know that in the DNA are the instructions on how to build an intelligent, conscious creature. And it's there, the solution is there, just waiting for science to discover how it's done. But we know, in principle, we know it's there. Okay? So if the brain building guys, if they can copy closely as possible how the brain functions, you know, by mimicking the brain, simulating the brain, closely enough, sooner or later, we will arrive at a machine that's that's like an artificial brain based, based on neuroscience ideas, principles. And that machine, because it's so closely analogous to the brain, our brain, biological brain, it will be intelligent and conscious. Let, 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 let that sink in, right? An intelligent, conscious machine. Yeah, wow, okay? So we know it's coming. Now, given the, the exponential increase in electronic capacity because of Moore's law, remember me talking a bit about, you know, from nanotech to femtotech, and then we could just keep going. So there's plenty of capacity in the future to, to, to create these massively intelligent machines. So, so the, the, the so-called experts in this field are confident that, you know, within decades now, it's just a few decades away, given the rate that this uh, progress is being um, achieved. So uh, if you then wed the progress in technology, uh, the electronics, you know, Moore's law, the Moore's law phenomenon, plus the exponential increase in knowledge coming from neuroscience, if you put those neuroscience principles together with the enormous electronic capacity coming from, from Moore's law, you get this incredibly fertile, productive wedding between these two, two phenomena. Moore's law plus neuroscience. Right? And then you get neuroengineering, neuroengineering, right? artificial brains. And uh, the, you, know, you, you draw the graphs and you, you, get, you can calculate the timing. And so probably by, I'd say in the 2030s, uh, people, you know, 
humanity, we, we will be seeing our artificial brains getting getting increasingly smarter, you know, year by year. We, we will notice ourselves just from, from common uh, you know, man in the street experience, you know, from, from, from watching their home robots getting smarter and smarter every year. So when millions or billions of people have that experience of seeing their own home robots and, and the products that they buy getting smarter and smarter every year, then they'll really start believing that, that you know, this is not a piece of science fiction. This is not some distant maybe that's a few centuries away. It's a few decades away. So if they're youngish people, they will see that within their own lifetimes, they're going to have to be confronted with this issue. This issue. Are we going, we humanity, are we going to allow these machines to be built or not? So, so you know, I, I hope I've explained why the, the so-called you know, brain builders of, of the planet are confident, if that's the right word, that, that you know, it's technologically possible within a few decades. I think that's quite realistic. So, if you ask, what kind of resistances might there be? Like, like you know, your, your proverbial man in the street. Why might he reject the idea that you know, this, this kind of cognitive machine, conscious, intelligent machine could come into being? <sighs> you know, it's sort of hard for me to put myself in the role of such a person because this is what I do, like, you know, 24-7 almost. I, I guess basically ignorance. You know, pe people are just unaware that, that, that you know, what's what's going on. Uh, some people have a kind of traditional, quasi religious attitude to, to humanity, as, as though there's some mystique, that, uh, that some, some some something innate in humanness that could never be reproduced in a machine. So, some some ideology like that. So to persuade them otherwise. I guess the most obvious way is just to simply build a machine that does have these cognitive properties and then they're just forced to believe it because it's there in front of them, they can see it. Right? But until that happens, I can imagine a lot of people will, will be stuck in, in their relative ignorance. You know, old, old world, old thinking, because it's, it's part of our culture. 